Good morning, Morro Bay. My name is Steve Allen. Um, I am the vice chair for the Tourism Business Improvement District. I'm sitting in for your chair, Charlie Yates, who uh, can't be here this morning. Um, on my left, we have Chris Kosteka. Uh, next, Amish Patel. Um, on my right, Isaac Sue and Joan so Solu. Um, we just scraped by with a quorum. Um, also joining us today is our fearless leader, Scott Collins, city manager, Jennifer Little, tourism manager, and uh, Heather Goodwin, the uh, deputy city clerk. So we do have a quorum. Um, Want to start the meeting this morning with a moment of silence. Now, if you please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we've got a busy agenda, so we're gonna try and move along. Um, as best we can. Uh, we're going to start off with any board member announcements. Seeing none, um, do we have any staff announcements? None at this time. Great. Okay, I want to open it up to public comment, but before I do, I just want to lay a few ground rules. Um, when addressing the board and you come up, please uh, say who you are, generally where you're from, um, there is a two-minute time limit, and we want to hear all your comments. Um, there's going to be some lights here. I believe they flash yellow to red. Um, so it should be no surprise when your time's almost up. Please be respectful and courteous of everyone's time. Um, I will be either turning off the microphone or asking people to um, step down if they go past two minutes, and we don't want to do that. So again, if we can all just be courteous and respectful, um, we can hear everyone's comments, and that's what we want to accomplish. So at this time, um, I do want to open it up for public comment. For items not on the agenda. For items not on the agenda. Thanks, Jennifer. Hello, I'm Janice Peters. I live in Morro Bay, and I am here representing By the Sea Productions. My mind is set on a three-minute timing, so I'm going to talk fast. Um, we were not awarded anything in the grants system this year. I just wanted to come and make a pitch for perhaps you sponsoring one of our shows, one of our... Uh, programs is up in front of you and it shows how we thank all our people who sponsor us. For us to do a live theater show, it's usually a hundred dollars a night royalties and performances. So we do uh, 87 performances a year, so that's $8,700. Um, if you do one show, we run for four weekends, so $1,200 would cover sponsorship of a show, and we would list you in our program, and thank you very much. And also you get tickets to the show and all of that, so it's kind of exciting. Uh, we've been here three years. We are now doing sellout performances fairly often, and we're excited about that. I was around at a bunch of yard sales this last weekend here, San Luis. Cayucas, and at each one I said who I was scrounging for because we're always looking for props and costumes and at each place they said oh yeah we know about you that's great we've come to your shows we are doing good quality work and we're very proud of that um, we get about 3,045 people per year at our shows. About half of them are from out of Morro Bay, so that's 1,500 people. And we have an average of five to eight out of the county at each show. So that's 435 people coming from out of the country, county, some of them out of the country. These are what we take around, um, our flyers, this is our publicity. We don't have a lot of money. We don't have a paid staff or anything. These are now in all your hotels and some restaurants, and we update them with each show. So you've got the current stuff that's going to be going up. Your program is from our last show. So we would hope that you could see your ways to awarding us a sponsorship of a show in our next season. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other public comment for items not on the agenda? Please. Hi, I'm Maggie Juran. Good morning, Maggie. And um, I am here, um, I did a 
deep study of the TOT and the final results for the fiscal year of 2018-19. And um, congrats, I see that uh, we definitely got gains. Um, when I look at that, I notice that the motel receipts went up 747575 over fiscal year 2017. Um, and yet, we spent 805800 8, plus the 157 that the city allocated to the T-bid from the general fund to get that bump. I think we'll all agree that a lot of that was due to Highway 1 reopening. And I just, um, and as you will notice in the star data, North Coast, Cambria, San Simi enjoyed similar gains. I applaud the great work of Visit California, SloCal, and the Morro Bay Tourism Department for getting the word out to the world that the Big Sur Highway was again open for business. But I believe the challenge lies ahead for next year as plans for more hotel rooms come to fruition and the economy slows as it is predicted to do. However, the results for the two hotels my company manages are actually down for this past physical year, with no significant increase in rates by us. My understanding is that one of the key components of the new tourism strategic plan is to market Morro Bay as the value proposition destination. But I question how this works in conjunction with other statements made regarding goals of attracting higher household income guests. And believe me, if you have eaten at some of the nicer restaurants on the Embarcadero recently, I think you would agree they are far from a bargain. With the new strategic marketing plan in place, three years of working with mental marketing, and the probable inclusion of more money coming into the tourism department from the VRs and RVs, I certainly hope that the budgeted monies for the coming fiscal year will result in continued gains for all of us. I want to throw my support behind projects that beautify our city and support new and improved attractions that will make people want to come more often. I'm sorry, Maggie. Longer. I'm sorry, Maggie. T-Bid Ford, it up. go forth and spend our money wisely. Thank you. And just to clarify, everyone, I think there was a comment that it's three minutes. It's actually two minutes. Yeah. So just be mindful. Thank you. Yeah, good morning. My name is Andy Hamp, and I would like to speak to that three-minute rule that was changed to two. We don't exactly have a standing room only crowd, and some of us prepared for three minutes, and it's kind of psychologically disadvantaged. You get rushed in two and summarize on the fly. So I would ask the board perhaps to uh, reconsider that rule and go to the traditional three minutes. Thank you. Hi, Sean Green, Morro Bay. Uh, I just want to second the uh, the three minute um, surprise that we were uh, granted with with a flyer on the door that says we have to only speak for two minutes when people prepared for three. Uh, I don't think that was publicized anywhere, and it just kind of feeds into the idea that it, things feel a little bit more predetermined than conversational. Thanks. Please. May I say something? Um, on and off, I've sat on this board probably t eight or ten years. I don't know what the number is. But I have to say that we rarely get public comment here. I don't know how many times you all have looked out to the audience and seen no one, but I'm totally forgiving everybody their three minutes here. I just feel like we finally have folks in the room who want to talk with us and I don't want to cut their conversation short. And it is tough to prepare for something and then come in and have to switch on the fly. A lot of people are nervous about public speaking and so they write something and they practice it and try and make sure they're not going to get buzzed off. So I don't know how you feel, but I'd love to expand it to three minutes. I agree with that. I am fine with that as long as the board will stay till we finish both agenda items whatever that timing is. Okay, let's uh, adjust to three minutes. Maggie, did you want to finish? <laughs> Would you like an extra minute? <laughs> I'll take another 30 seconds. <laughs> That's fine. If you want it, sure. 
thank you. I wanted to take time on my speech to thank the merchants and the restaurants and the hotels for posting our publicity because that's the only thing we have really. We can't advertise big money and so we really appreciate those stores that put our posters in the windows, the hotels that have our rack cards in them. That really helps us and we do surveys to find out how people hear about us and the posters and flyers are one of the main sources of information. So thank you to the community for that. We really appreciate it. And just a little thank you to Scott for appearing in a demonstration play that we did at the Rotary two weeks ago. He was wonderful. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you have any video of that? Uh, I think there is. Oh, perfect. You can email that to me. I'd appreciate it. Any other public comment? Seeing none, we're going to move on to the consent agenda. Uh, do we have approval of the June um, board minutes? Are, are we moving to the, con we're on the consent agenda, right? Correct. Um, can we take it all at once? Is, is that okay, staff? That's fine. Uh, uh, I make a mo motion that we take A1, A2, and A3 for file for um, for approval for file. Approve is submitted. Yes, thank you. Approved is submitted. Appreciate that. Do we have a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Approve is submitted. Uh, moving on to business items. B1, consideration of inclusion of the vacation rentals and recreational vehicle parks in the Tourism Business Improvement District assessment. Um, any discussion? I'll go ahead and uh, go through Please. the staff report part of it first and then you guys can discuss it afterwards. And um, Scott's here to answer any questions you have as far as how this would proceed forward through City Council. If you have any questions, I'll, I'll leave that to him as well. So we're going to talk about um, RVs and VRs coming into TBID and how that would look and the possibilities of, of them coming aboard for January 2020. Um, quick background on vacation rentals. Basically, they have to be there less than 30 days to be considered a vacation rental. Anything longer stay than that does not pay into as a vacation rental, it's considered a long stay. And that is for any sort of a multifamily dwelling, condominium, townhome, single family homes of any sort. Currently, there's 250 registered vacation rental licensees, and we have another 90 on the wait list. I'm not sure what what's going on with the wait list, but Scott can give you a little more on that. For RV parks, uh, RV parks are a little different as we've talked before. They are, they definitely have a different mix. They are booked out, you know, a year in advance sometimes, and um, they have some long stays, some short stays. Megan called around to all of the ones here in town to find out what their mix was, and it's it's not black and white. I mean, it changes depending on the year and what they have coming in and out. But um, she has a, a graph that she's put together that I have up on the screen, and it's in your packets that shows roughly the spaces that are available and what's available for less than 30 days. These are based on looking at uh, Good Sam to get these numbers versus the state parks. As we know, we have quite a few spaces with our state park which are not avail available to pay into the bid. We have 214 total spaces for state park. For the privately owned RV, um, we have 403 total and 266 that there's a possibility of being part of the bid as far as less than 30 days rental paying into the bid. When we uh, started this process, this is uh, the third time we've gone through this process since, uh, since I've been here. This is my fourth year, and I think this was our uh, best effort going forward at really looking out to the community and reaching out. We brought in Lori Keller as a contract, and she did significant community outreach. She did two workshops that were well attended and um, really engaged the uh, two different communities. She also um, had quite a few one-on-one -on -one meetings with different groups, mainly um, manager groups that manage several different establishments instead of just single owners. And we also have um, our list, our email list and hard mail that we sent out for those community activations as well. So we tried to engage anyone that was willing to be engaged. 
I want to give you some background on the TOT for us as well as in the county. Um, looking at, if you break down our total money that comes into the city, basically hotels make up 78.66%, so we can just say 79 if we want to round it. VRs are about 14.5 and RVs are 7%. That's how they break down as far as, so if we're looking at our budget, you'd kind of break them down that way as far as priority and what we'd focus on for the different the different groups. When you look at our neighboring TOT bids, they're all pretty much at 2% right now. Uh, Pismo currently has a 1% increase. That's why they're at 2% and it possibly might go down, but um, there's nothing that's slated to change that right now. The budgets are what I wanted to call your attention to. So even though those are at 2%, they're still significantly higher than us because they do have so many hotel rooms. Um, Pismo is well over $2 million a year. San Luis is at 1.5, and Paso is just over $1 million. So they're all well over our $800,000 budget that I think we do a lot with, and considering that some of them are paying double, I think we're doing really well at sticking, there, sticking with them for half the money. So um, I applaud all of the board for all of the direction that you've been giving us this last, last year. I added some possible options which are on the screen and they're also in your packet. Um, the staff report just showed one, two, and three percent. I went back in and added two and a half and one and a half so you have more options to look at as well. And these are broken down by motel, RV, and VR, what they would tentatively be based on 2017-18 uh, final numbers. So if you look at them, um, I wanted to draw your attention to the 2.5%. That's fairly close to a break-even. If, if everybody reduced down to 2.5%, which I know has been a discussion with the board, that would put us at roughly 850000 right now, just with motel hotels. At 3%, we are at roughly 800000 so that's fairly close. Um, the one thing that I would caution you about is that you really need to realize in your mind that if we reduce down to two and a half, you're gonna reduce down the total money that we can sell hotel motels. We're gonna reduce it down to probably 650 because we would need to allocate funds to push out to VR and RVs. So keep that in mind when you're, when you're kind of processing through this. Does that make sense on that, you guys? Yeah, okay. For uh, budget allocations and where we would put the additional funds, I just made an assumption of $100,000 coming into the budget. Just It was an easy number for me to use. So what I would recommend is to put $75,000 towards our direct marketing, digital marketing through different channels that would influence those specific um, areas, whether that's on Airbnb's website or different aspects that are very specific to those two groups. And um, our outdoor goals, 15 second videos would be a really perfect fit for them. They promote the destination. They would fit well in, in those um, different websites. So I would recommend doing those with some um, probably gifts as well for the destination. I would recommend to add $10,000 towards event and grant support that would be more of our springtime events that also influence guests in those, uh, those two quadrants. So the car show, kite festival, the high school wrestling tournament is also a good one for vacation rentals. Digital assets, I put $6,000 towards that. That would be um, getting new photographs. We'd want to get all, you know, photographs of all the properties so we can show them on the, on the site and give them equal representation. And um, probably also um, some videos, some more 15 second videos of like camping and more of that outdoor lifestyle you'd have if you were you know, in like a home style setting, maybe eating outside on a patio from your kitchen or kind of that type of idea. So we, we definitely want to put some more energy to that. Visiting journalists, we'd want to get some visiting journalists in specifically for vacation rentals and RVs. They approach us all the time and, you know, I just, I say no right now because it's not in our mix, but I think it would be a really great asset to be able to show that we have some of these journalists that come into town. Um, and then miscellaneous is just, it's just kind of a catch-all. It's, it's writing content. It's the website updates with Simple View, different things. And I've put $5,000 towards that in our budget as well. So those are my recommendations as how I would use the additional funds. Jen, I've got a question real quick. The two and a half is assuming that the city is going to continue their contribution, correct? With your budget numbers, how the 
it would be roughly the same with a reduction You're talking about the general fund contribution? Correct. So that's a, a conversation that happens every year. We never know what that's going to be. I would, I would assume it's going to go away. Was that a good assumption? or? I, I mean, I think we're, excuse me, um, the discussion at the budget this, this previous year was to you know, reduce it back to the base level of 60000 and then reevaluate um, going into 20, 20, 2021, the next budget cycle. So there, there hasn't been any indication one way or another if that would go up or down or be eliminated. Um, but we are obviously monitoring our budget for pretty closely and anticipating a half a million dollar deficit for next year. So that should give some indication of where that conversation may go. But at this point, um, I, I'm not comfortable saying one way or another what, what will happen. Yeah. Ultimately, it's a council decision. And um, to add on to that, the original um, agreement with the city when the tourism came into the city was a five-year agreement for them to put money in. So at some point, it will, it will stop. I believe this is our fourth year funding. So, But it, it's, it's totally not in our hands. It's council decision. Okay. So in conclusion, um, I'm not coming here with a recommendation for you. I would like to have good conversation between you as a board and really kind of thoroughly talk this out and what you think as far as percentages, hear from the public and hear their opinion as well. And um, hopefully we can come to an agreement. We have to have four on the board in agreement with the same percentage to move it forward to council. We also need a recommendation on when you would like to have it included. I would recommend to do January. I've talked with um, city legal staff and they feel comfortable with having that um, happen mid-year. So we are totally open to whatever you guys want to talk about and have good discussion. And Lori Keller is also here if you have any questions for her. She does have to leave probably by 10. so. Um, you might want to ask questions to her first if you have any, and then we'll let her go. Why don't we start with Lori? Lori, you want to come on up and give us your two cents? Good morning. Good morning. I don't really have much more to tell you other than what was in your board packet in my final report, and then Jen went over. We did do three community outreach meetings. Um, we had some dialogue with a variety of people, and uh, the third meeting, um, Mental Marketing came and, and presented the marketing plan. Um, I did, in addition, have several one-to-one -one meetings with both RV owners and vacation rental owners, and um, so the, the synopsis of those conversations was incorporated into my final report. So if there's any other questions you have, I'm happy to answer them. Lori, I have a question for you. Well, first of all, I just want to say you must have done an excellent job. I think we're expecting a much larger turnout of questions, so a lot of people must have felt heard um, and understood, so that's great. From a practical standpoint, um, if VRBOs and RVs are going to be contributing to TBID, from a practical standpoint, somebody who booked a year ago received a confirmation uh, showing what their you know, cost is going to be, and now, starting 2020, there's going to be the T-bit amount. Have they discussed how they're going to make that happen? Is that a, a challenge that's going to happen whenever this goes on? I understand that, but have they thought about the, thought that through? We didn't um, discuss that topic specifically, and I don't know. Scott has probably a, a few thoughts on how to how that might be managed. <clears throat> yeah, I don't have a great great answer to that one. Um, you know, we do have a few members uh, in the audience today who, who may have a perspective on that. Um, you know, but we, we are also looking at fee fee study and, and for different things that the city services provide. And you know, so we try to account for that and sort of signal when a decision would be made and when it would go into effect, so that there is time to to account for that. But I mean, I don't think we could necessarily wait another year. I mean, this has been a kind of a ongoing discussion for almost two or three years now. So, um, but it's a fair point. And, and, you know, again, the audience members may have a perspective on that. Lori, when you say uh, th thank you, first of all, for all of your work, I appreciate it. It's nice to have a neutral third party out there kind of feeling everyone out and um, respectfully getting the dialogue going so that it's not adversarial. I'm just a resident in the mix. I'm not a vacation rental owner and I'm not a hotel owner. So I'm a resident in the mix and I'm glad to see it be uh, 
resolved in this way so uh, so that there's a greater conversation. When um, you say that you spoke to several vacation rental owners, do you know of the 200 plus vacation rentals that we have in Morro Bay, uh, how many of those were represented by the people that you spoke to? Was it 100, was it 10, was it 200? Um. You know, I'd have to go back and look at the exact numbers, and Jen may even remember too. But I think it was it was about fifty. It was fifty total units or fifty owners. So fifty they represented fifty units. They represented fifty units. But if you spoke with, and I'm going to, sorry, Maggie, I see you in the audience. I'm, this is all with a smile. Um, if you spoke with Maggie, Maggie, you have, uh, she has a, a, 34. A, a bunch. Okay, so she has 34. Okay. And then um, uh, another question I had was, did any of the people who are, I'm just curious, on the wait list uh, for the 90, did, do you know if any of the wait list folks came out and spoke with you? A couple of them um, came to some meetings, and they um, were thinking that the meetings were more about um, vacation rental advocacy and oh. some of those kinds of things. So there were a couple of people that came to a few meetings. Okay. And then this question is for Scott. Scott, do you know where we are as a community for moving forward with an overall ordinance uh, for vacation rentals? Um it's a bit a bit of a uh, conundrum here. We we're going through the update of our general plan local coastal program, um, which kind of governs our vision for the next twenty years uh, in terms of uh, development and growth. Um, it's it's in the the hands of the coastal commission staff. Um, we've had a lot of discussion back and forth uh, about resolving any outstanding issues and bringing it back so that the city can adopt it and, and then have the coastal commission, the actual commission itself approve it um, it's been four years in process maybe longer and, and um, we're hoping to have that resolved this summer um, with that being said the same staff that works on that would be the staff that would work on a vacation rental uh, ordinance and so um, we anticipate that'll be a very lengthy discussion and, and a challenging and controversial one and so we want to make sure we have our best staff available to, to, to move that forward so we we anticipate the vacation rental would be kind of on the the tail end of the completion of the general plan local coastal program. So we're probably looking towards the end of the year. Okay. Um, in the meantime, we are um, engaging with uh, host compliance, which is an auditing firm for uh, vacation rentals. A lot of, I think over a hundred cities are um, clients of host compliance. Uh, what they do is they audit, um, they look at, at all the kind of online uh, information about, you know, Airbnb and all the other, uh, sites that that offer this service check those against the city's database of compliant vacation rentals and then issue warnings and and then ultimately enforcement action for those who are operating illegally but it also helps us understand if we're receiving the proper amounts of tot from the the, the uh, actors who have permits so that is a that's going to help i think address some of the issues of illegal rentals that are, that are operating out there um, because you do have people who are following the rules and waiting in line mm -hmm. um, and others who aren't. So that we're hoping that will help a little bit, but ultimately the bigger, broader policy discussion is looking like the end of the year, potentially later. Okay, and this is kind of a on-the-edge question, but um, I know that there's several folks in town who have um, recreational vehicles that they rent, but they drop them into a state park campground space that the person has reserved. So I'm going to use my own name. Joan Solu rents a state park campground space. Scott Collins rents the RV uh, out to Joan Solu, drops it on the space, and I show up in my car and camp over the weekend, and then you come and pick up your... Do you know if those rentals are subject to TOT? <laughs> and it's happening, so don't think it's yeah. not, folks. Oh. It's happening. That, that Scott Collins guy's a smart guy, huh? <laughs> um, should, should follow in his footsteps. No, I, I, uh, that's a great question. I, I've heard, I've heard of that happening. I've heard of um, people renting their RVs in their front yards. To be oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, I, I don't know. It's, it's kind of the wild, wild west on that in terms of uh, regulation. Um, you know, we're sort of looking broadly at RV 
maybe looking at it differently and maybe allowing for camping in the city, you know, um, you know, sanctioned uh, stuff because it is sort of an issue that's bringing up um, maybe slightly tangential, t tangential to the homeless issue as well. Okay. So, I mean, it's an area of exploration. Okay. I, I don't have an answer for you. All right. And then um, I don't know if you'll have an answer for this either, but we have a little bit of disparity in our vacation rental uh, lodging businesses in that we have a couple of vacation rentals that are brand new builds. They were brand new builds. And at the time that they were brand new builds, subject to them getting their building permits, they were licensed as hotels. Their vacation rentals operating under a hotel business license. They have been paying into the bid for years or in the case of Salty Sisters, just a couple months because they just opened, I think. Um, do we know why the decision was made only to have vacation rentals that were new builds operate that way and not the vacation rentals that were existing homes? I mean, do we know how that decision was made so that we can understand the logic behind that as we're... It may be because it's their waterfront properties. I'll, I'll have to check with the planning director. I don't want to go go too far in the discussion okay, that I'm not sorry. familiar with. Yeah. It's, it pertains be, right. from, in my mind because right. we have kind of an unfair playing field amongst just vacation rentals right now. So, okay, uh, those are my questions for staff. Thank you for, thank you, thank you for your answers. Thank you. Any other questions for Lori? Thank you very much. To public comment? Okay. We're going to open it up for public comment. Three minutes. Hi. I'm Maggie Juren, and I'm co-owner of two prop vacation rental property management companies here. We manage 34 vacation rentals in Morro Bay out of the 250 licensed VRs. And based on final TOT numbers for the fiscal year of 2018-19, we paid 39.3% of the total TOTs for VRs. I tell you this so that you understand that standing here, I represent a significant portion of the VR monies. So I ask the board members to please give the appropriate weight to the following positions I will make here. First, I want to thank Lori Keller for her efforts in reaching out to the VR community. I have reviewed her intake notes from the June TBID meeting and she did a great job of comprehensively capturing the feedback she gathered. And I assume all of you reviewed this in detail for this in preparation for this meeting. I just want to cut to the chase here and tell you what our two companies and our owners support for VR inclusion in the T-bid. We agree that VR should contribute to the market and promote and promotion to the marketing and promotion Morro Bay as a tourism destination. We feel that VR should participate at a 1% or 1.5% level for the following reasons. One, we do not see that there is any benefit for VRs to be listed on the morrobay.org website. VRs are typically searched and booked on VRBO, HomeAway, Airbnb, TripAdvisor. For fiscal year 2018-19, while the hotels had a 3% gain in revenues, VRs enjoyed a 12% gain, and this was without being listed on those websites, on, on the site. This is really just due to the increasing popularity of VRs as the preferred lodging source. Many of the promotional efforts, uh, number two, many of the promotional efforts sponsored by the T-Bid will not be applicable to VRs, kids' passports, free bottle of wine, efforts spent to attract tour groups. Event promotions would be of limited values to VRs since our typical customers come together for family gatherings and friends and friend getaways. Our average booking window ranges from 70 to 130 days out, and promotion of those events take place much closer to the event. Offering a VR uh, at the lower percent, we would um, be in favor of not putting a VR position on the board, but just giving that money for general promotional uh, and marketing. However, if you bring us in at 2%, then we recommend that hotels reduce their asset assessment rate to 2% to put, the re put to rest the current resentment felt by much of the hotel community towards VRs. If this is the direction you go, then we would expect that all VRs would be listed on the website and a board seat would be given. The objectives and KPIs of the board would need to be revised. Um, 
I continue to object to the fact that the TBID was formed under 1989 rules, so it continues to go on in perpetuity. So if we're included, I will continue to fight to change that to, 1990, to the 1994 rules. Um, I ask that the board keep in mind that we will most, you know, typically be paying an additional half percent. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Good morning, board. Uh, my name is Ian Starkey. Um, I'm the owner of Rockstar Properties here in Morro Bay, um, and I manage uh, 15 vacation rentals in the city of Morro Bay. Um, I couldn't have said it better than Maggie just said. Um, my company and my owners are in full agreement with everything that she just said um, regarding vacation rentals. Um, two things. I questions I bring up regarding it um, is one um, of the. Um, way we are going about having the, the vacation rentals and um, RV parks added to it, um, that is decision from the hotel owners to bring it in, I feel from the other side that it should be a decision from the vacation rental owners and RV parks to decide if they'd like to join this. Um, so the way about it is, is a thing I am in discrepancy and my owners are in discrepancy about. Um, to answer a question that came up earlier regarding tax and if this does go into effect, um, my opinion, and I've seen it before, um, when we a few years ago changed from um, having the no county 1% tax and we added the 1% county tax um, to the vacation rentals, which I believe happened two or three years ago. Um, at that point in time, how the county instructed us to handle it was any books, any bookings that were on the books already for that time period would be exempt from that 1% and any new reservations during that time period, so after, say it was January 1st, 2020, would have that 1% affected. Um, as a property manager, um, us personally and a lot of sites collect the fees immediately upon reserving a home. So I have reservations on the books already for summer of 2020, um, and we have already collected full payments for the, from those guests. So at that point, going back and asking for additional payment is not something we have a valid contract for that time period. But any new reservations moving forward, I would recommend implementing that. Um, and then also any reservations after January 1st. Um, so that is all, and I appreciate your time today. Great, thank you. So uh, good morning, TBID board. Um, my name is Andy Hamp. We own Cypress RV and Mobile Home Park in Morro Bay, but I'm also here representing other RV parks. Uh, Morro Dunes that Clausen couldn't make the day because he's siding trailers for his customers before they check in at noon. Larry Giznos, Giznos uh, from Morro Strand is out of town until tomorrow. Uh, and then Arlene Orman from Bay Pine, she's in the audience with us today. And uh, once again, you know, we oppose the RV parks being forced into the T-bid for several reasons. The veteran T-board members TBID board members know the arguments, I believe, by now, uh, but f um, the new ones may not be so familiar, and congratulations to the new board members we haven't talked to yet. But anyway, main reasons why we oppose. While the county assesses TOT and visits locale TMD on hotels and vacation rentals in unincorporated areas, it does no such thing for RV parks. Now, most of the literature and the staff report that you say talks about state parks being not included in any assessment, but it's more than that. It's much more than that. Uh, it's not only a state park, it's the county-owned parks that do not pay TOT or the TMD, and also every single private park that is not in a city does not pay any assessments whatsoever. That means we are currently at an 11% rate disadvantage, maybe going up to 14.5%, depending on what happens on the county level with their 1.5% plan increase and what uh, happens here in Morro Bay. So that means there are eight parks in our neighborhood that will never be assessed anything. You know, that's like saying every hotel um, from here to Ragged Point, Cambria, um, San Simeon doesn't pay any TOT, doesn't pay any TMD, doesn't pay any local T-bits. And uh, there's the eight in our neighborhood, there are two private parks, three state parks, a county park, two federal parks, and we'll soon include a 200 space park uh, in Avila that will be exempt from any assessments as well because they're uh, not in a city jurisdiction. 
So the other point is that we're a completely different industry than hotels and VRs. RV customer behavior, market trends, competitive environment, economics are all substantially different than hotels and vacation rentals. And just to give you a few examples, a uh, sufficient number of RVers have been coming to the coast long before the TBID was formed. If you look at long-term TOT data, compared to hotels, our growth rates have been more stable and less cyclical, especially during recessions, and uh, capacity is more in line with demand as compared to the hotel industry. Uh, the RV industry has been booming across the country with record unit sales growth. We have a much more transparent industry structure. There's only a handful of us in town. RVers find us and we don't need the TBID marketing machinery. And finally, we're spending substantial sums on destination marketing already. Visit Slocal is promoting RV destinations for only 11 parks, six of them are in Morro Bay. We spent hundreds of thousands over the last five years with uh, very little benefit and uh, adding the TBID will be overkill. And also, we're vastly outnumbered and at the mercy at the end of the day of the hotel industry. So in conclusion, we don't think it's unreasonable to be excluded from the TBID along with the restaurants and many other tourist oriented business in town. Thank you. Thank you. Hi again, I'm Sean, Hi, Sean. Green from here in Morro Bay. Um, uh, while I, I recognize that, uh, that public comment to the hoteliers uh, may be a little bit more futile in this environment than it will be in, uh, to council next month. Uh, I do want to briefly talk about uh, today's agenda because that's all we see um, from the public standpoint. Um, we just received a, a, a staff report um, up on the board and in the agenda as well uh, that provided, uh, by Jen's own words, no recommendation about uh, any percentages or inclusion. Um, add that to uh, the, um, the independent uh, consultant's report that offered three sentences of recommendation based on no evidence on the recommendation report that's published uh, publicly in today's agenda. Um, my students write recommendation reports every quarter, my college students, and if, that, if those were the parameters, there would be no basis for accepting that recommendation or lack of. Um, so what that leaves us is uh, five board members who are going to vote on something based on no recommendation or statistical evidence or any kind of any kind regarding return on investment or anything like that, um, which you know gives the impression to the general public that preconceived feelings and notions about those percentages are really all that this vote is based on. Um, I appreciate the, uh, the staff report that shows increased budgets as a result of increased taxes, but that's, I mean, we could raise taxes to 50% and, you know, obviously the budgets will increase accordingly. Um, so I think it's just a little bit disappointing from a public standpoint what we see on the agenda, knowing what direction the vote is likely to take. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And just to clarify, the recommendation from staff in the report is that we do move forward. You're correct that there is not a specified percentage in here. Uh, that's in the, okay, but she just explicitly said no, uh, there was no recommendation when she presented. Any other public comment? Okay, seeing none. Um, because this is somewhat of a larger issue, I would like to go through um, each board member and just kind of hear um, how you feel and your thoughts. So Joan, why don't we start with you? Okay. <laughs> I hope that wasn't gender-based, gentlemen. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a, yeah, ladies first, right? Um, okay, I have a couple of questions for, based off of public comment. Um, that I want answered before I start uh, my mind really rolling here. Um, I heard and I actually read uh, the public comments that came in. I want to thank uh, Mr. Green and, uh, you know, Sean and Andy. Sorry, I know you guys that way. So, Sean and Andy, I want to thank you for your public comment, both written and um, verbal here. And... Um, Maggie also, and Ian, I um, appreciate you coming forward. It's not an easy thing to step forward, especially on an issue that can be seen in the community as controversial, right? So I appreciate that. Um, now, in terms of staff, I'm hearing, um, or I think I heard, that um, 
the county. Oh, sorry. I turn you off. I'm sorry. The county, the county unincorporated. Sorry, maybe I'm talking low for a reason, right? Uh, the county unincorporated area, uh, the CBID, the CBID does not include, does not include, RV parks. The CBID, the county unincorporated bid. I mean, not, that's what Andy said. That started no, ten years they ago. They don't include it, correct? Okay, yeah. Yeah. but Vizloc does. So Vizloc includes the unincorporated, but they don't in, they don't include the government run. And w what I mean by that are municipalities, counties, and state or federal campgrounds. Correct? Right? Because we can't we don't tax ourselves as taxpayers. They're saying so that's their deal on that. Um, but Vizloc includes all of the privately run campgrounds and RV parks. No. I'm asking staff, does it include, do not we have in that the answer? unincorporated sections of the county. Not in the unincorporated sections of the county. Right, so the CBID, unincorporated. No, Vizloc. Visit San Luis Obispo County. I, I mean, I don't know, Lori, if Lori can, Andy's like. For, you know, the 3,000th time, no, they cannot, can I go to the police and ask that question? I don't, I, 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 you know, I don't know, I don't know the answer to whether you can come up or not, but. It's fine, I mean, Andy, you, please, no. mm -hmm. yeah. Without the, uh, the added comments. We've been to a zillion discussions, and this topic never gets understood. We were, when the TMD, the Visit Slow TMD first come, we were shocked to learn that every park, private park in county jurisdiction will not be assessed. The reason is that there is absolutely no mechanism to, create, to collect TMD because there's absolutely no mechanism to collect TOT. Gotcha. For historical reasons, TOT was never assessed on any park in the county, and it's not going to happen because it will probably take a vote by the people, and it's just a huge will that's never going to happen. So Rancho Colina, right outside the city limits, never pays TOT, never has probably never will, they do not pay TMD. Um, Bella Vista up in Cayucas never does, never okay. will. And um, of the 37 parks in the county, only 11 get assessed anything. There are two in Pismo Beach, six in Morro Bay, and there are some of very low TOT assessments, and uh, two in Paso. Every single park, no matter who owns them, in the rest of the county gets a free ride. Thank you, I Finally, appreciate your thanks. answer. Okay. Appreciate that, thank you, Andy. Ask the guy who's working in the biz and you'll get the answer. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, okay, so that helped me a little bit for some clarification for um, for RV parks. So uh, now in the in the staff report, I have to say I, I too uh, was hoping to see a recommendation from staff on something that they thought would be sustainable and viable. I understand um, the, the division of funding into the separate groups in terms of budgeting, but I was also, uh, so I, I hear the sentiment um, that, you know, we were hopeful to get something, because I do think it puts pressure on the board to make a decision that's just kind of out there. And as a resident, you know, um, as a resident, I've said this a million times, as soon as there's an emergency at my house, I want the loudest fire engine with the biggest lights, headed up there to save my kid or my husband or my dog or a visitor, whoever it is that needs help, right? And in order to do that, we have to have a funding source for that. And in Morro Bay, that funding source is driven through tourism. And a former Mayor Peters always sat up here in the center and would say, it's tourism, 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 that's what's going to get us through until we find another mechanism to build our economy on. A few years ago, we changed the way we were operating our tourism mechanism and we pulled it in-house to the city and there was a general fund contribution that began. As a resident, I never really liked that general fund contribution. I thought that this this mechanism should stand on its own and not be sustained through the general fund. Um, but if that's the direction that the city wanted to go in and that was the resolution they were putting forward, then that was the direction that we went. Um, the percentage that they were 
that the city was contributing has been um, pushed down further and further, and I think th that we would have blinders on to think that it's going to exist in the future, especially hearing today that we're going to have a $500,000 deficit in our next um, go-round with the city budget. And that's really unfortunate because that gets us back to the fire department and the big truck and the lights and the sounds coming up to your house or your hotel to rescue a guest, right, uh, in need. Um, so I think that... Uh, then I look at some of the vacation rentals that have been brought in because they were new builds were brought in under a hotel permit and they're unfairly being assessed while all these other vacation rentals are sitting out there and they're not being assessed. So there's a disparate measure there. And then I think back all the way to the beginning of the, the bid and the conversations we had with Andy and other vacation rentals. Andy, I appreciate you hanging in there. It's the two of us, right? The last, the dinosaurs. Um, and, and I think of those conversations and I, th I hear, I hear the vacation rental plight. And I see how RVs are being dropped into probably county, I, I only considered the state ones that I saw happening here locally to avoid TOT payment and, and other payments that they would have to make. Um, I don't even know if those folks have business licenses. Um, for me, I think it's fair to bring the vacation rentals in. I'm not bullish on bringing in the RV parks, to be honest with you, as a resident. I just I think that there's a disparity there and it doesn't exist within our own community. I think it exists within the overall business model that exists within our county for the RV parks. Um, and, and that's because of county pressure, state pressure, and federal pressure on their industry. Um, I think that I read the staff report carefully, and one of the lines that I saw in the staff report said that uh, they recommended that if we decide to bring, or if we decide to make a recommendation to bring anyone in, that uh, it should be for January uh, 2020. It should commence in January 2020. They would go through the six-month collection cycle, create a, a budget and a marketing mechanism, and they would reassess at the end of that six months to see whether we needed additional staff. And then that gets me concerned as a resident because adding staff to a budget that I hear is $500,000, would that happen? Well, 1%, whether, whether it's 1% or 3%, the tourism team is going to have to deal with the same amount of owners almost the same amount of work because they're going to have to devise a marketing plan and follow through on that marketing plan whether it's one dollar or whether it's a hundred thousand dollars. So those are my comments right now. I'm, I'm more bullish uh, in terms of bringing in the vacation rentals. I don't know, uh, I haven't, I don't have a mindset on the exact amount, although I think that if they came in at $1, it's human nature. I'm not pointing fingers or anything, but if they came in at, say, a dollar or $1,000 and they came in at $100,000, they're still going to be concerned that they're contributing. And I use the, I, I think that a good example of this is um, the Cloisters. The Cloisters has an assessment district, if you know where that is, and uh, it's capped at $150,000, I think, no matter how long it is. So 20 years ago when they put that in, that was a great deal for the city. Fast forward 20 years with you know wages and minimum wage and water increase, everything that's gone. That's not a good deal for the city, but uh, as a resident or as somebody contributing to that, you expect, you expect the maintenance of the park and the general areas to be the same as it was 20 years ago, right? So what I'm saying is to create an equal playing field, I would expect that at some point the hotels and the vacation rentals would have to be equalized in terms of what they're putting in. Um, 
but I'm, I'm not really comfortable with the RV parks coming in at 3%. If we want to bring maybe them in at a lesser percent, say the uh, RV parks at 1%, and maybe the vacation rentals and the hotels at a matching percent to be determined for a recommendation by the board, then that's kind of where I'm at. Great, thank you, Joan. And just to confirm, we need four board members in agreement here. Yes, I mean, th there, this isn't a formal, um, this isn't initiating the process. It would go to council. The council would then send it back for a formal review of the assessment report, which outlines the six criteria by which you can um, have the T-bid. So four would be helpful. Um, having some, you, you know, some general consensus uh, would be more helpful for council than, than if, if it's a disparate amount uh, or you know, no clear recommendation. Okay. One, one other thing I forgot that I'd like to add was a Miss Jorgensen, Maggie made uh, a comment that I've long believed, which is that this bid should be moved from an 89 bid to a 94 bid. And, um, you know, I think that th that's neither here or there today because that's not up for discussion, but that should be a future agenda item at least for us, and especially if that's something that the vacation rentals want to discuss. Great. Let's bring that up at the end of the meeting. I think ultimately we're looking for yes, no, and then a percentage, and ideally getting a um, consensus among the board here. So, Isaac? Um, yeah, this is tough. Uh, I I don't know much about RVs. This is kind of my first experience, uh, like listening, hearing, and I've never even been inside one. And just from my initial reaction, I do feel like it is a different market. It's a different um, just business industry uh, compared to hotels. Uh, so I'm. I wouldn't be, I don't think it'd be fair for them to come in at 3%. Um, if they come in at all, I do think, I, 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 if they had to be assessed something, I think 1% or something lower than motels would be most fair. Um, in terms of VR, uh, I do think it would be fair uh, to have them ideally assessed equally as motels and hotels. Um, and so for me, I think 2.5% sounds for, for me personally, as a as a hotel owner, that would be great, but I understand if VRs, you know, would be against that, and so I think as a compromise, I'd be willing to stay at three percent as a hotel owner, maybe bring in VRs at two percent, and then if we wanted to bring in RVs, bring them in at one percent. Um, so that was that would be my I think that would be the most fair and kind of a compromise for everyone because it would keep the T bid budget about the same and you know everyone's losing something but everyone's also gaining a little bit um so yeah either one two three percent or all the 2.5 percent thank you so just to clarify yes bring them in either all at two and a half or yeah i think um i'm open to all at 2.5 or one percent for rvs two percent for vrs and three percent for motels okay Thank you. Okay, um, first off, Charlie Yates couldn't be here. I asked what his position was. He supported um, you know, equal assessment of 3% for RVs and um, VRs. Um, Morro Bay, my personal opinion, is a very special place, but the economics here are tough. Um, labor, affordable housing are issues. I think that's the whole other part of the economics here is, you know, the more vacation rentals, the less rental housing stock we have, but that's a complicated issue. Um, it's almost like we're a little island here. It's a beautiful place, um, but it does have its challenges. The TOT right now is 10%. You've got a 3% bid for hotels. The TMD is 1%, and that's proposed to go up to 1.5%. Not all hotels pay up, but Visit California is an additional 0.2%. So we're looking at a total of about 14.2% for hotels, and that could very well go up to 14.7%. To give you an idea, San Francisco is 14%, LA is 12%. Napa is 13% and Santa Barbara is 12%. The only other area I could find that it would be higher is Anaheim. And guess what? We don't have a Disneyland to draw people in here. 
Um, we have a beautiful destination place, but the expenses are tough. It's tough to run a hotel here. Personally, I think everyone should pay their fair share. Does that mean that the T-bid may look different? Absolutely. Um, maybe our website changes. Maybe we don't give out the bottles of wine. Maybe we change things um, so it supports the RVs and the VRs. But I think everyone should pay their fair share. We're in this together. Um, should it be 3%? Well, I'd like it to be, but I think it would be easier for everyone to accept this if it were a little less. So I would support everyone at 2.5%. I wish it could be less than that, but I don't think the economics works for this area, unfortunately. Um, so I would support the inclusion of VRs and RVs uh, at an equal amount, whether that be 25 or 3%. I have quite a few notes, so it, it may uh, dot around a bit. Uh, Sean, you nailed it on the head um, when you spoke, uh, preconceived uh, coming here. And I, I have. I've had a preconceived uh, feeling on this from day one. Um, all the discussions have uh, affected that. Um, maybe not enough to change my position. Uh, I'll get to that in a moment uh, regarding the RVs. Um, I guess it comes down to where our focus so much is on, if we're going to call it that terrible word, attacks. And so the view of it comes in kind of negatively. Um, I'm an old school guy. I'm not on the computer all that much. Um, but I've come to the realization over the last few years, and especially on being on this board, that it is the world that we live in. It's extremely competitive. So we're competing um, with the dollars that we're producing against all the other cities that are on our the TBID reports here. Um, and we have to compete with those for every tourist that comes in. So maybe our focus needs to be more on the value of what you get for those funds. Um, I agree with Joan 100% that uh, I don't really like the idea of the general fund monies. Like, like the money, that, that's a good idea and it helps out our industry, but it doesn't make sense when we have an alternative source. So I think we have to focus on our source through TBID, uh, what we can generate. Um, but that competitive part again, we have to produce the monies to, to make the best websites and the best advertising plans to get the tourists in here. Um, so that's the big question. You know, we, are we sold on TBID, are we not? Uh, and if we're sold on it, how do we make it as functional as possible and as fair as possible? I guess the term fair, it, it, fair is a, is a thing we chase and we can never achieve it um, from so many angles when we talk about fairness. Um, High-end hotels, you know, that 14% is a big chunk on that bill when they think they're paying, you know, two ninety nine for a couple of nights, and then they see their bill at the end of the day, and it's eight hundred and some odd dollars. And they're like, "Whoa, what happened here?" So, is it fair that ho you know, small that expensive hotels pay a higher amount than cheap inexpensive hotels? Uh, we can never achieve fairness. Um, T bid and the associated other taxes. There, it's a transient tax. So, to me, a transient is a transient. If they're coming by RV, they're coming by. Uh, camping, they're coming, whatever, they're transient, and they're utilizing sources within the city. Um, those funds then help us to bring more tourists, tourists in, which then takes more taxing on the city. So to me, a transient's a transient. Um, sounds like such a tough word. Um, I don't think there's a resentment. Someone had mentioned a resentment. It's not a resentment at all. I think it's just common sense um, that we're all looking for tourists, and we're all benefiting from them. In my mind, and I've, I've read some studies that agree with this, a lot of tourists start out as campers. And they're sleeping in a tent, and they're sleeping on the dirt, and they evolve into that RV motel world. And uh, the low end are, you know, little campers is maybe the next one, and then the high end RV, the next thing you know, they're in hotels, and they're in high end hotels, and ultimately they're on cruise ships. It's kind of how tourism dollars people funnel through. So uh, the RV tourist becomes the future uh, hotel and the hotel person can become the future cruise. So we're all capturing these people together. Um, the RVs, that's the chink in the armor, Sean, that, that comes to me. I, they have a really unfair playing field there. Um, I think if we did tax them, if they paid in at the 3% like everybody else, we're not their problem. That's not the problem. They're, they can get that benefit. Um, it's it's uh, all the other county, municipality, and state problems there. 
Um, so again, I want to go to the focus broadly on these dollars, and I think the best way if, so, so my recommendation is still the 3% for everybody. Um, I think if you go to RV and you drop it to 1%, it's almost not worth the policing to make sure they're paying their fair share. It's such a low amount of money for somebody to get on board and, and, and to follow that. Um, so I still am on that 3%, but I truly think that there must be an RV person, industry person on this board, and there must be a vacation rental person on this board uh, to make those dollars work for those industries. So I am still of the belief that it should be 3% for all three entities. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Amish. Um, in my perspective, Moore Bay has one of the highest taxes in the tourism for the county at 14%. To make it different for each different aspect of the tourism, RVs, VRs, and hotels, um, I don't see that. I think everyone should come in together at the same percent. Um, if anything, if we did decide to move it down, um, I think two and a half would be a good compromise, considering if slow cal does bring on that additional half percent. Um, I wouldn't want to see more bay move backwards um, and go to a lower percentage when 14's been working so perfectly for so many years. Um, more bay definitely is in a unique area, and considering our own um, barriers that we have, uh, especially with the weather. Um, some people like it, some people don't. Um, it definitely brings in a different tourist here. Um, but I think for the most part, um, I was surprised to hear what uh, the public had to say about RVs um, and how they're not fairly treated with the county. Um, I could see possibly having them at a lower percentage, but I do agree that if we did bring them all at the same rate, I would want equal rep representation um, of at least an RV and VR member on the board. Uh, so I guess my recommendation is going to be um, either everyone come in at three or we can compromise, go down to two and a half um, so that at least we don't lower our 14% tax here in Morbay. Great. Thank you. So it sounds like we're close. Joan, do you have any further thoughts? There was a comment made at the very end of uh, a public commenter made the, the comment that um, until restaurant retail services were also had a conversation. So, um, and that's been a long conversation as well. How have they benefited and how do you trigger help from them for the destination? So that's something that we should probably look at as a future agenda item. Um, but in terms of, I guess I'm going to look to the hoteliers on this board and say if you want to go to 2.5%, do you have the stomach to have $125,000 removed from your marketing budget on your industry? Because that's what we're talking about. And likely, once the vacation rentals and RVs come before city council, in turn, in the spring, when budgets are approved, it's likely that the fifty thousand dollars will be uh, refund uh, will move over to the general fund and will not come through, especially with if a new source of funding passes. So my question for you is, do you want to see one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars or you know, about 15, between 15 and 20 percent rough math on your marketing, destination marketing removed, um, plus an additional 50,000 for events if you go down to two and a half. And that's a question I have for you guys. How do you feel about that? Well, I think if we all went down um, and if to two and a half percent, 
it wouldn't just be a reduction in the marketing um, budget for hotels. It would also be a reduction in an expense for our guests too, right? If it's going from three to two and a half percent. Um, I don't know if you all have watched the news this morning. The economy is not looking too great either. So I think we're all going to have to make some cuts here in the near future. Um, but yes, I, I think we could work. We would welcome new board members. Um, we would work with staff in the budget. Um, there are some cuts to be made. We've already discussed that. Um, so yes, I think that would be very doable. I'm not as excited about that. Um, and that's strange to hear coming from me. Um, I'm not a big corporate uh, entity kind of guy, but I do believe in this board. And I do think the monies that are being spent on this board are um, not only being done well, I think they're 100% necessary in the environment that we have. Every one of those other cities has million, two million, three million dollars to work with to put those advertising medians out, and I think we're competing with them, and I think we need those funds to do it. In my perspective, uh, I feel that being at 2.5% and including the VRs, we would still be roughly at the same percentage that we are at 3% if we didn't have VRs, which we currently don't. Um, so, I feel moving down to two and a half percent um, wouldn't make that big of a difference as we're still marketing more Bay as a whole. Um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it would be okay. I think those are all dollars that you know aren't going to waste. We can, you know, use that for our own personal advertising or you know use it to improve the hotel. Uh, in our own methods, in our own ways. Um, I don't think it's going to be lost money, per se. And then also it, it gives that sense of parity and fairness. And so I, I think that is worth the, the loss of the advertising. And Joan, I want to be sympathetic, too, for the RV and the VR um, community. I think 2.5% is going to be easier to accept than 3%. I do have a concern that it could be viewed as hotels receive a discount, even though it's not money in our pocket. Um, and I don't think VRs and RVs are going to be excited with two and a half. So I don't think it's this great compromise. It may be the right answer, but I don't think it's going to be universally applauded. Well. I think that there's been a conversation about the whole thing being disparate and disproportional with the hotels, you know, carrying it for the last eight or ten years and vacation rental. It's all different, and you know, vacation rental revenue has increased. Vacation rentals have come on to the lodging industry. Uh, it's a new blooming industry, uh, which is very positive. You know, it doesn't help Morro Bay's hotels that. The federal and state per diems are so low. It's one of the reasons why statewide, actually, that um, vacation rentals are growing, because federal and state travelers can stay much more affordably in a vacation rental, especially around here. We have, I mean, our per diem is the same as Visalia's per diem. Why would Morro Bay have the same per diem as Visalia's? It's crazy. But the per diem rate really does affect what happens here because a lot of um, federal and state travelers return as vacationers and then they want the lower rate. The per diem is the federal rate that the government says that, um, thank you, the federal rate, or the federal or state rate that the government says that um, their travelers, so a manager or somebody traveling, can spend on a hotel room per night, including tax. Um, so it's very low for Slow County. As a matter of fact, it's like $150 higher for our surrounding counties. Santa Barbara and Monterey is like $200 higher than us, uh, which is unbelievable. Um, and that that affects us. I think water and sewer rates have, I just spoke to, or uh, am aware of a hotel that had uh, for July, um, or for last month, their water and, uh, and sewer was $7,000. That's a big pill to swallow. $7,000. Um, and so 
with the economy coming looming, like Stephen said, um, you know, if if it makes it, I'm I am concerned about Chris's question was, do you think it will be viewed unfair that the hotels are getting a discount? I I think no matter what, anybody is going to say something somewhere. It's just human nature, and um, it could. We could say we're all going down to 1%, which I don't recommend, and there would still be something to be said. So, it, it, you know, um, I, I don't think that we're ever going to make everyone happy, um, but I'm looking at what's best for the community. And when there's an economic downturn, which is why the TBIT actually started, it started during an economic downturn and the city cut the budget for marketing. And during an economic downturn, marketing helps to at least stabilize the portion of economy that's being marketed. And for us, that's a huge portion of our economy here. Um, if this board wants to recommend 2% across the board, which is, or excuse me, 2.5% across the board, which is kind of what I'm hearing as a sentiment, um, I will go with the board, although I am very kind of strained over the uh, over the RV parks. I'm very strained over that conversation, um, and I would recommend that as long as we brought back a conversation to figure out how we could have restaurants, retails, services, including board rentals and kayaks somehow included in a tourism marketing effort, whether that's a membership or whether they're actually a percentage, then I would go uh, with the board's sentiments so that that would help to equalize the RV parks. I think you have two future agenda items now. Let me give some more thoughts on the marketing side of it. Um, Joan said it, and actually you said it too, Steve, that you know we are possibly looking at a downturn in the next few years, which, I mean, we're definitely seeing a slowing. If you go back and you look at the comparative cities and how they're doing and what they spend, they are not doing really well. I mean, if you look at the June TOT, Paso is down three points over last year. They spend over a million dollars. Pismo Beach is down one percentage, and they're at $2 million. San Luis is down four points, and they're spending over a million dollars. And I guess my, my point that I want to just make on this is the money that we have, the 800000 I mean, we're really scrappy with it. We work really, really hard with it. And we do a lot of hotel-specific marketing to help move that dollar up and get our occupancy up and our ADR up. And just you need to keep in mind we're talking about reducing down the total cost that we're going to spend to market hotels. And I, I can't guarantee that it's going to keep growing if we're going to take over $100,000 out of our budget that we use to push out hotels and motels right now. So I just want you guys to really, I mean, our budget is very, very small, you know, I, and you'll see it with the grants. I mean, you guys have all seen the grant staff report. I mean, we're not funding even half of the grants. So I just need you to keep all this in mind. It's a it's a very big deal that we're talking about reducing down total total money. So it sounds like your recommendation would be to stay at the three percent. You know, I I don't really have a recommendation. I thought that coming in here without giving you a specific percentage was really important because we need to hear what the public says. I mean, they're going to be you know hand in hand with us, and I wanted you guys to really hear their opinions and and we've done as much outreach as we can with them. But um, if you're talking about reducing down the hotels to two and a half. You're talking about reducing down what I can do for you on, on marketing advertising. It's just that black and white. You know, it's not, I mean, if you look at the numbers, I'm not saying increase staff or our overhead. You know, it's all about the physical dollars that we spend to market the destination. And it would go the same way. You know, the, the payroll is going to be the same no matter what. We're going to have to reduce down our destination marketing you know, aspect, which is concerning. You know, that is concerning. And I, I know Scott already spoke to this, and you know there was multiple comments. But I, you know I too I think the writing's on the wall with the city contributing to this. If you look at their budget, um, so point well taken. Thank you. I'm not sure I agree with what Joan said about sediment at two and a half. I believe I was. Uh, I, I know I'm still thinking three. I think you were thinking three. I think Charlie's thinking three. 
Um, and the other three members, um, I, I've, I've heard both. So maybe we need to hear again from the two members that had, you didn't give a succinct number. I had recommended between two and a half to three. Um, I think I'm just gonna need a couple minutes for me to take this in um, and get a harder number out of that. I can go. For me, for three, like, as a hotel owner, like, I don't really care how much these people pay, right? But I think, I don't think it would pass. Like, I think there'd be a lot of lash. And it's, it's hard to ask someone, you know, who's trying to contribute to contribute that much. And I feel like, for me, it's just, um, I just wanted to be kind of, I don't know, merciful. I don't know if that's the right word, but like give them some sort of reprieve, you know, and um, acknowledgement that like, thank you for coming in and contributing with us, you know, we'll, <clears throat> and as a concession, you know, we'd be willing to let you only have to contribute a lower percentage. So I just, I just think that for me, I just want to see something get done, right? I, I don't want to have us all agree, but then it, like, I think after we approve here, it has to go to some sort of board, and then if 50% of people protest, it's just gonna, nothing's gonna happen, right? It would go to uh, city council, and then come back to this board to initiate the process, and then go back to council for public, the public hearing process. The protest works on, I'm not gonna get this precise, but you know, paraphrasing, it's based on the, kind of the economic value. So hotels represent about 80% of the overall economic value of the tourism trade in this, this town. So basically the only way that protests would succeed is if the hotels were against it. Oh, okay, and that's okay. something that's been brought up in the discussions, uh, in the outreach. I mean, it's, it, it's the, the way the system was set up, okay? Uh, we, don't, we don't make those rules. That's, that's how it's governed by the state code. So that just gives you an indication of how um, okay. how that would go, but you know your point is well taken. I think that's what this this board and council was interested in doing. The outreach was to try to create a process by which people didn't feel like they were being forced into something. They felt like they were walking into something, um, you know, that they wanted to be a part of and understand that, you know, up to this point since 2009, when the decision was made not to include them, that that they've been benefiting from the work that you do and the money that you pay into. Uh, marketing um, so it's not an easy answer I mean we struggled the staff whether we wanted to put a recommendation out there because we had some false starts with this a couple years ago um, putting something out there and having uh, significant backlash um, so this I think this process invites a little more dialogue um, you know Jen Jen's outlined some of the concerns about a reduction in overall marketing power if if we go to two and a half um, if you did three two um, that wouldn't be an issue, but then there's still disparity, and hoteliers may continue to feel some resentment into the future, and we may be here a couple years later having a similar discussion about narrowing the, the gap or you know, eliminating altogether all the other cities in the county are, are equalized uh, between vacation rentals and um, hoteliers and the few that have RV parks. So uh, again, I don't think there's a right answer here, um, but the, the, the considerations about limiting the marketing power is, is important with um, the, the whole discussion about a recession that sounds like it's here with the an inversion of the 10-year versus the, the short-term interest rates. That, that's pretty much been a predictor of the last 50 years of recessions. Um, that, you know, if we start to limit our abilities to, to counter that effort or counter those, those market forces, we may, may be doing ourselves a disservice. But, Again, we didn't want to recommend anything because this is really, I mean, hoteliers, you're, you're going to kind of dominate the, the overall outcome of this, and we want to make sure that it's something that you're comfortable with. No matter what's um, passed eventually, again, nothing's being passed here today. It's just a recommendation. I'd like to, I'll challenge in the future um, the marketing plans is I don't want them to be specific. I, I'm hoping that day isn't, oh, well, hotels is generating this, so let's right. do so much that's going to help hotels. I would like all the advertising to be more obey big picture. 
right. and let people stay where they want to stay when they have vacation rental if it's a big family an RV if they have them right. um, it, but it's just marketing Morro Bay as a whole right. and not special right. stay two nights in a hotel get a bottle of wine that's right. hotel specific that's right. pretty you know um, I think those things would have to be eliminated or don't have to but should be eliminated it, it, it absolutely I mean the, the the state code is pretty specific about um, you know that equal benefit for for what you pay in so that it would change the approach to marketing when I say marketing dollars I don't mean for hotels I mean the overall Morro Bay if we if we see a reduction that's a reduction for everyone right correct I'm going to float a motion. I'll see if I can get a second because this has been 10 years talked about. So it's coming to a head at 10:30 today, and <laughs> we're going to get a motion out there. Uh, I move that we recommend to the city council to include vacation rentals. into the Morro Bay T-Bid beginning January of 2020 at 2% and beginning July 1st, 2020, 2021 fiscal, they come in at 3%. I further motion that RVs are included at no more than 1%. Let's see if I can get a second. I'll second it. Hey, somebody had to put something out there, so let's, you know. I mean, I like it. I, I think I just want to get something done, and I feel like um, any concessions we can make to VRs and RVs are going to make this happen. And so I'm totally, I don't want to bring people in at 3%, you know, and, and get a lot of backlash. I mean, and I think I don't think it'd be fair for us to get a discount. I think um, keeping us at three percent, you know, it'll keep the T bid at what it is, and so they'll be happy. Um, I think, yeah, keeping motels at three and then bringing uh, VRs and RVs at a lower percentage is the most, it's the best compromise. It's going to make make the most people happy, if that's even possible. <laughs> it, it won't get my vote. I don't think compromise is the right word. I think if this, if we are providing a value, I think it's an equal value to all industries. Um, I'd like to comment. Um, while I do like the staggered approach to this of January 2020, 2% and July 2021 fiscal, um, did bump it up to three to make it equal. Um, I'd like to see it equal across for both VRs and RVs. Did you want to amend or do you want to make a motion? Or, uh, or do you want me to take a vote? I'm sorry. I would not vote for that. I, I agree with both of their comments. Um, I think, you know, the budget, you know, based on Jennifer and Scott's comments, I, I do see the value of 3%, especially if we are going into a recession. Um, you know, I thought about compromise, but at the end of the day, you know, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can see what other cities and municipalities are doing. They seem to be all equal. It seems to be working for them. Um, I think, you know, I have no problem with the staggered approach, but I would ultimately like to see everybody at the same rate. Even RVs? So I'm going to turn to the city clerk now. Hi. So um, in this case, what I'm hearing is that this is a no-go, and I would, I would need to amend my motion to go up to 3% across the board. I'm just looking down there at my, gentle, my gentleman partners. What do I do? Just withdraw, rescind? Withdraw? withdraw? Your, That's what I want to know. redo it, just withdraw. Okay, I'm going to withdraw my motion and allow another board member to make a motion for discussion. <laughs> I'll make a motion uh, I re that uh, this board recommends to the city council to move forward with including VRs and RVs in the tourism business improvement district at 
3%, making all three industries equal. Beginning um, at the fiscal year of June of 2020. You mean the beginning of next fiscal year, July 1st? Is that, is that what you just want to confirm that's what you mean? Yes, I'm thinking July 1st. Yeah. I think the doing it in January would be very messy. And if we've gone this long, 10 years, at least it would uh, come into effect in July, and that will be a lot cleaner for the, the newcomers. Do we have a second? I have a quick question. Uh, would you be open to kind of doing an in-between of also working up to that 3%? That way it's not a big, um, I guess, shock as Jul July 1st hits and you're assessed at 3%. Maybe they can work their way up from 2 to 3 over the course of two years. I don't see a shock. I think when someone goes to book after July 1st and they're on their website or they're talking to a property manager direct and they get their quote, they see their quote, and they'll decide at that point if it's of value or not. Um, I would hope that maybe we even start that focus in our marketing even prior to July 1st of a more corporate, more obey focus. Um, so I don't, I don't see a shock factor. What about staggering something starting January? I would actually like to hear from somebody uh, in the industry as to how messy that might be with their bookkeeping. If is that able to be done? You, we have a the gentleman there. I think it's Ian who's raising his hand. You, you can bring him up for a okay, question. Ian, can you come and speak yeah. to that? And you can ask this. Thank you for asking our opinion and, and how functionality-wise this would work. Um, from a functionality standpoint, most all reservations for vacation rentals are made online, either directly on our company site or on a third-party platform. We don't have the ability to put multiple tax rates on that site. Um, and so and you, typically, we don't have the ability to dictate tax rates on specific dates. It is a broad spectrum tax rate for all reservations. So having a tiered system would be a bookkeeping nightmare and a lot more difficult for managers and owners directly. Um, doing a system such as what we did with the 1% tax on the county, when that increased, essentially, as of January 1st, 2020, any reservations made from January 1st, 2020 further, meaning not stay dates reservations, but reservations made would be taxed that new assessment. So right now, if we made any reservations made now through December 31st of 2019, would have the tax rate that is currently placed, whether it's for a stay in 2019 or 2020 or even further. And any stays made January 1st, 2020, on whether that's in January, February, or anywhere further would be at the new tax rate. I have a question, sir. Yes. Do your contracts read room rate, or pardon me, vacation rental rate plus applicable taxes and fees? Um, they do read, yes, our contracts read room rate. Um, there is typically a cleaning fee that most people in the industry add on, and then a tax and fee line, and it is all or it lined out, and most guests pay at the time of reservation. Correct. Um, and we have those funds in advance. So okay. all right. going after the fact and reassessing um, would be voiding our contract that we have with them. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? No. Thank you. So... Oh. Um, if this is coming to fruition, um, we would probably want to make an amendment that's, that would state a, date, a booking date, not a stay date. 
Correct. A reservation date. Correct. Okay, reservation made date. This Correct. would help with the counting purposes. Yes, okay. a reservation's made book date. Correct. Um, and from there, anything booked further. And having a single amount as well would be beneficial, and I think for all parties involved. Anything else? Thank you. Scott, how difficult is that with the city it, to formulate a form that's going to, that's quite different than how we're paying currently? We're paying based upon revenue at the date of stay. Th that would be a, a question that, you know, b depending on how this goes, it, the next step is to talk to my finance director, figure out, since say she oversees the, the remittance and how that would work. Um, we're pretty flexible. I'm sure we could make, make, make that function, but Jane might not have something else to offer. I think it has to be date of stay for TOT, but you're talking about when it would go into effect would be based on when it's booked. That's, yeah. is that what you're saying? It's two different things. Well, I think I figured it out just okay. thinking here. Yeah, they could yeah. be collecting in mm -hmm. January, but they're not they're paying not it. Until yeah, they don't it. stay till June, right. and that fee would be collected from the city in June. Right, because yeah. your, your form is still the same. It's you pay for that month. Who stayed that month? Correct. Even if they paid you six months in advance or... It's different than a hotel. Usually in our hotels, we don't collect in advance. Right. So that's why the difference I got. So did you want to amend your motion, or we're still looking for a second? I, I need it repeated, though, so I don't know where we're at. I'm so sorry. Uh. I'll amend my, uh, my motion. Uh, recommend to the City Council to, for to move forward with including vacation rentals and RVs in the Tourism Business Improvement District at a rate of 3% with effective date January 1st, 2020, on all reservations received from that date forward. Do we have a second? I'll second that. I'm just going to ask this one more time, and I know I feel like I'm beating a dead horse over here in my corner. You're sure you want to go for the RV parks at the same level? That's all I'm going to say. Begrudgingly, yes. I think they are in a, uh, that word again, unfair position. I don't believe what this board is doing is where their unfairness is coming from. Any further discussion? I mean, Chris, would you be, what other alternative would you be open to? Is there any other alternative you'd be open to? If my motion can't pass, then I would have to be willing to other alternatives. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, we've got it. Yeah, let's take a vote. Okay, so all in favor? Uh, wait, wait, we read, can we read it back one more time so we're very clear on what we're voting on? I want to be very Let's clear. Are you, are you want to read it? So Chris's motion is to include RVs and VRs at 3% starting January 1, 2020 for all reservations received from that day forward. Second by Amish. Okay, and we need four for majority? Correct. Okay. Why don't we raise our hands? All in favor? Four. That's it. That's it. And this goes to the city council. Is and there, can we get a, a voice vote on that? A just, voice vote. Yeah, just so we know if there's a yes, no. Are yeah, we pulling the board? Well, it, we have in favor. Who's opposed? Was there any opposite? Because that's important for the record. I can ask some time. <laughs> no, no, you, you can't. You need to vote. I know. I have to say it does not feel right, but I'm going to go with the board. I think we've discussed this for 10 years. Yes or no? Yeah, you've already. Promise. Why don't you start? Aye. 
Yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, she has the poll. Okay. Vice Chair Allen? Yes. Board Member Kostaka? Yes. Board Member Patel? Yes. Board Member Solo? Sorry for pronouncing your name wrong. Yes. Board Member Sue? Yes, begrudgingly. <laughs> Passes. Thank you. All right, so we'll, we'll take the, uh, the kind of the issues you were kicking around. Um, we'll make sure that's as part of the report. And um, obviously, we anticipate there'll be a, a lot of good public comment as well. The so City Council will cover anything we've missed. Um, you know, we appreciate that the board, you know, struggled through that. It's not an easy one. It certainly won't be easy for council. Um, but we'll make sure that the, some of the comments, you know, that captured some of the, the key issues will be brought forward for council in their discussion. And that, again, just so you know, that that will be the council either agreeing or disagreeing or whatever they may do. It will then have to come back to this board to, to initiate the formal process and then, and then back to council for completion of that formal process. So it, it will take a while. Pr pretty much the rest of the fall if, if council decides that they want to proceed forward. Scott, you think January is realistic? Yes, yeah. it is. Based on uh, my, the city clerk, she, she went through each meeting and all the notification requirements and it, it could be done um, without rushing, which is good. Okay, great. I'm, I'm relieved that this is going forward to the city council because it's their job to look at the city as a whole mm -hmm. and every aspect of it. So it'll be good for them to have a broader mm -hmm. scope on this and for it to not feel as if it's one industry trying to swallow another one. That's my resident input. Thank you. Yeah, and we'll, we'll also, I know the board didn't take kind of a, put a opinion mm -hmm. on this, but the, just the board representation will will also be part of the discussion mm -hmm. at council and then come back to this board. Great, Thanks. thank you. Thank you. So moving on, B2, a 1920 mm -hmm. event grant support application review and approval. Sure. So um, just to go backwards, we went through our event grant outline a few months ago and we had that approved by you and so we opened up grants. We had 25 grants come in. Funding is extremely limited. We have $50,000 at this time. Um, so my recommendation is just to approve the, I, I categorize them into three separate categories and just basically to approve the, the, the 11 that are high tourism driving events at this time. <clears throat> if you look at, I have a list of uh, the, the events. It's Avocado Margarita, Central Coast Writers Conference, Harbor Festival, Morro Bay Triathlon, the Tall Ships coming in, Light a Boat Weekend, Winter Bird Festival, Surfers of Tomorrow, which was a pre-approved by the board last year, uh, Morro Bay Yard Sale, Kite Festival, and then Cruise in Morro Bay Car Show. Um, there is an opportunity once our uh, budget from last year is closed and we see if there's funds that will move into this year. It'll go into an accumulation fund, but we can go back to city council and ask for those funds to come into our budget and be assessed for different items. And so there is an opportunity to fund uh, a few other events if we want to do that. Um, so that's not to be addressed today. My recommendation is just to approve the 11 at this time and then uh, it's unfortunate. I mean, I think there's some really good events in the, in the other areas, but we just don't have the bandwidth right now, unfortunately. So to go through them, I want to just give you some quick outline notes mm -hmm. on the different ones. The pre-existing, I would call them tertiary events that are not being recommended to be funded is the Santa's House. That's a rotary event. It is also something that was brought forward by TBID two years ago, and we helped Rotary Fund building it. They have an agreement with the city for the city to store it. And so getting that approved, I think, with additional budgeting once our budget is reviewed, I think is really important. I think it's something that we've committed to, and it shows activation during the holiday season, which we just we don't have a lot going on any time during winter. So I, I'm concerned about not approving that, but at this point, I, I think that's where we need to be on it. The uh, CIT wrestling tournament, we usually give them a couple thousand dollars. They do fill hotel rooms, um, but they're coming in no matter what. I mean, it's a, it's a 
scheduled tournament that comes in every year. So I'm okay not funding them. The three crawls, the Halloween crawl, Santa crawl, and the Leprechaun crawl were also activations from TBID. And um, they are growing. They, one of the things that we've actively had them do is to separate out zip codes so we can really see if they're coming from out market or in the county, and they are substantially pulling from out market. Um, I would recommend two over three, just the, the Santa crawl and the leprechaun crawl and not do the Halloween. There's just too much competition during the Halloween season. Snow day and elf on shelf, I would probably recommend not doing this this year. If we needed to cut something, that would be where I would recommend to cut. And then Morro Bay Wild, uh, was it came in last year. It was our first time we funded it, and they had very limited. It's like a one-on-one -on -one, um, tour of the facility. It's really nice, but it's a very local-based event. I think they had like 20 people last year, so it, it's really not something that would be funded through TBID. And then the new events, I'm recommending to not fund any new events this year. Two of them on there are really not events. The Outdoor Writers Conference is really a PR outreach, and so we could always relook at that from a PR aspect. And then the By the Sea, which Janice talked about earlier, that's um, you know the local theater. I think, again, that would be a great way to maybe sponsor or do some advertising out market to help them grow that would be good. So that's kind of the three different categories that we're going to go through. Um, Funding-wise for the first 11, so the Central Coast Writers Conference, that has been in Morro Bay <clears throat> now for three years. It's housed at the Inn at Morro Bay, and it's out at Cuesta. It's a four-day event that starts midweek, which is good for us. It houses also in town. I know they've contracted with several downtown hotels as well, and then all the authors stay at the inn. So it has a nice movement through town. They do all their evening events in Morro Bay as well. When I originally came to Morro Bay, that was being housed at Pismo Beach. And it's right here. It's at Cuesta College, so it just was not, it didn't make sense to me. So we've gotten them to move over, and I'd like to keep supporting them. I think it's a really good group to support, and they come back throughout the year. Avocado Heart and Merida, obviously a really key event for us. It's a one-day event, but I think it warrants good funding from us, and so I recommended $3,250 towards their funding this year. Harbor Festival has, they last year for the people that are new on the board, the board really gave direction to Harbor Festival last year to relook at the event, expand it out, look at what they could do to really get back to our harbor routes, and they've really done that. They're going after a three-day event now, it's being moved to the Triangle lot, which is really fantastic. It's going to be a gated event with a ticket price. And so I would, I've uh, put down $5,000 for them. I mean, to me, it is an old event, but also to me, it's a new event because they're going to three days. So I truly appreciate that they heard our words last year and they've really made a valiant effort for their first year of expanding that. The Morro Bay Triathlon is a Sunday event here in November, always good for Morro Bay. One of the things that they have offered us this year is to put Morro Bay on their final arch. So when you come through the finish line, it'll say Morro Bay um, at the top, which I think is a really good addition for us. It's never had our logo on it. So I think that that's a nice addition for us to get a little more than just um, physical dollars towards their advertising. So I think they wanted $800 for that, if I remember right. The tall ships have a requirement of minimum $6,000 to come into port. This year it would just be the Hawaiian chieftain. The Lady Washington is going to stay in Washington for her anniversary, or her birthday, I guess you'd call it. Um, but they will be here for 30 days, which is really great. They're here during the holiday season. So again, it's one more thing down on the waterfront that's harbor-focused, fits in our strategic plan, and really gives a little more interest and vibe going on during the winter months, which is really critical for us. And, and how Morro Bay looks. The uh, Lighted Boat Weekend, that's a rotary event again, and they are on board to still continue doing the large boats Friday night with sponsored by the restaurants and then the paddle parade on Sunday. That's been a nice change that we did two years ago to get the non-motorized um, boats out of the Saturday night parade. It was kind of dangerous, and it helps us expand our weekend. So I'm hoping to see that you know keep growing, and, and it's doing really well. And so I'm happy with where they're going on that. The Winter Bird Festival, again, uh, it's a long-standing event in Morro Bay. So we've uh, put in for $3,000 for them. I think one of the things I would like to go back with in my letter is that we would really like to see them add another day for next year. Not this year, obviously, but for next year. I've, I've decreased their amount, but I'm going to ask them to, to, if they want to increase their TBID funding, to please 
get a fourth day in there for us. I mean, their events sell out like the second they go online. It's just crazy. So they could, if they can figure out the bandwidth, they could go to more days. Uh, Surfers of Tomorrow, that's the WSL event that we've talked a lot about. For you that are on the board new that were not here last year, this is an um, event that the board approved to sponsor. It is being put on by SoCal. So SoCal is also going to put $50,000 towards this event. It's going to be a series. It's called the SoCal Open at Morrow, Morrow Rock. And then they're also going to do the one in Pismo Beach. And they're hoping to, within the next 12 months, have a third location for the following year. So it'll be like a three series. They're really looking at it like an Amgen. They want it to be like a series of three really big surf events that'll grow over many years. So I think this is a really, really good thing that we're um, on the lead on. The yard sale is just the $1,000 sponsorship for the use of their name that they started with the Morro Bay Yard Sale. And so we give Morro Bay Beautiful $1,000 in return we use their name and tourism manages that event does well we've expanded into four days and it's a lot of crazy yard sailors here in town but they fill the rooms in april so it's good I know. it's really good um kite festival is a large grant i'm requesting ten thousand dollars for that so last year was our first year that we uh had them come forward with changing the kites out to go with the all sea creature kites and the flying octopuses did really really well they come over from the netherlands so it's a very big financial um, impact on them they did request last year for tbid to help with that which is what we did and I, I think it's only right that we follow that up with at least one more year of of sponsorship on that to i mean it just had great Great movement. Unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of wind last year, so I'm hoping we have wind. Um, one of the things that I did suggest against in their budget, because they had asked for more money, and one of the things that they wanted was they wanted to have these strolling characters that sing. Same with the Light of Boat Parade, and I, I took that out of their budgeting, because to me it's not needed. It's just additional money that we can put somewhere else. So I took both those out of those budgets. And then the car show, obviously always really good, does great for us in May, and so I recommend $4,000 for them as well. Jen, I was looking at that, uh, really like the one she picked, and the neat thing, almost all of these, uh, Avocado Festival, Morro Bay Triathlon, Tall Ships, Lighted Boat, Surfers Tomorrow, Kite Festival, and Car Show are all great photo ops. Yep. So again, we want to fill rooms, first and foremost. Second off, we want great you know, the writer's conference is nice, but that's not really a photo op opportunity. Um, yeah. But the others are. That just right. makes our website look awesome, which later on converts to hotel rooms. So I like those. And then what are the dates on the Kite Festival? It's last weekend in April, okay. always. And have we tried to ever get them to go midweek? Any chance that they could do that? Probably not. Okay. I mean, it's it's really hard to get people here. They've they've been trying to go Friday nights, and they just don't. People just don't show up. Yeah. Too bad they don't have glow in the dark. Yeah. Kites. They actually do. At the Visit California event that I went to down at Huntington Beach Pier a couple months ago, they had these lit ones that were really cool. Uh -huh. Yeah, they're pretty neat. Um. Uh, I like the overall recommendations. I did hear what Ms. Peters was saying about the theater, how it draws folks. And I don't think, um, I, I think with year-round performances, that gives us something in winter, too, that our hotel guests can you know, easily get to inside of our town. Some, some of them can even walk to where they, I mean, that's walkable from all the downtown hotels and stuff. I don't know if the board would feel like maybe we could put $500 towards them to support their year-round theater. They're a um, nonprofit also and a group of volunteers here. Um, I, you know, $500 I think would go a long way for an organization like that, believe it or not. Um, and if it were me, I would probably take 250 from the Winter Bird Festival and maybe 250 from either the writers conference or um, maybe the avocado margarita because they have 250 there and make them an e even 3,000 but it would be up to you guys I mean that's just a suggestion tell me what you wasn't there an opportunity for more funding later you were speaking of well they don't really fit into a typical 
event grant scenario. And Janice and I talked a lot about it, and I appreciate her filing for it. I think that advertising them and pushing them out to people coming in market is really an important key thing. So I think we could do something like that. So it's two different things. If we do a sponsorship and give them money, they're probably going to use it for infrastructure to help build their, you know, their theater production, I would assume. Where if we want to do a advertising campaign pushing out to whether it's Central Valley or LA or Santa Barbara, we could do something like that. And we could do it during, you know, midweek off season. You know, to me, I think that's a better use of money and not take it out of the grant funds, to be honest. Jen, just to clarify, um, these recommendations were vetted by a subcommittee? They were. It was a nine-person subcommittee. We had two board members that sat on the subcommittee as well. And, uh, yeah, we met thoroughly and went through it all. Super. Thank you. Okay. As long as we can do something, I, I think, you know, advertising them and getting their ticket revenue up is going to help them in the same way that flowing cash to them would. As long as I think, you know, all of these organizations, almost all of them are all volunteer, and we have such a, I mean, Stephen put it very well, we have a unique economic island here that we exist in, and we also have that same island when it comes to volunteers. We have a lot of the same volunteers. I could probably name at least 10 people that I know that volunteer for at least three of these events on here, at least three either organizations or events. So um, if we can help any of them anyhow, I feel really great about that. But I think these are terrific recommendations. They're all great organizations. And yeah. Want to make a motion? Sure. I move that we accept uh, the recommendations of the subcommittee and move forward with our event funding as... Will public yes. oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Long meeting. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, public. Public comment. Please. Please. All right. Hi, I'm Michelle Roost, and I'm the new chair of the Winter Bird Festival at Morro Bay, the Morro Bay Winter Bird Festival, and I'd like to introduce Jeanette Stone, who is the new vice chair. Our organization has uh, been around for 23. This is our 24th year. Next year will be our 25th anniversary, so we're looking at making it uh, an, an exciting event. And also, um, both Jeanette and I are, well, Jeanette's been around for a long time on the board. I'm a fairly new board member, and we've had kind of a generational turnover on our board uh, in the last couple of years. A lot of long-term board members have uh, retired out, and we've got some fresh energy. So we're learning um, about what the city's priorities are. And I just heard Jen say um, that trying to expand our event into another day, that's not a problem. We kind of unofficially already do that because we have people coming in on Thursday night. Uh, we have kind of an informal um, drinks and scopes on the deck, well, that's with telescopes and binoculars, and a glass of wine, looking at the birds right off the deck at the, at the inn at Morro Bay. And that we call it early check-in. We get about 250 of our registered people checking in on on Thursday night because they got to be ready to get out there on their field trips at 6 o'clock on Friday morning. So we, we can easily make that a more formal addition. Go ahead. Plus on, on Monday. So it is a four-day event um, because we have events on Monday as well. So yeah. Yeah. just we just wanted to clarify that three days is really four and then with Thursday night. So we're going Thursday and people are leaving on Monday afternoon. So. But we'll get better at making those commun at communicating and, and hearing what you guys would like. So thank you so much. We really appreciate your recommendation. And we look forward to continuing to connect with you yes. personally. And thank you to the board. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other public comment? No. OK, seeing none, I think we're good to make a motion. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to make a motion, but first I'd like to say congratulations to the Bird Festival. 25 years with all volunteers. Way to go. I mean, I could get my little sparkler hands on that one. That's terrific. I think that's awesome. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so uh, I move that we accept the recommendations of the subcommittee regarding the event funding as presented. Hmm? We have a second. I'll second. 
Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion passes. All right. Um, declaration of future agenda items. Joan, I think you had a couple. Uh, yeah. So I wrote down a laundry list. Uh, excuse me. Um, so for future agenda items, I have that uh, we wanted to talk about um, a possible way to include uh, retail and restaurant and services, including rentals, kayak rentals, paddleboard rentals, all that kind of stuff, um, in some meaningful way into the tourism mechanism, into the tourism destination marketing. Um, is that something that... Uh -huh. that kind of like with the Downtown Association in San Luis Obispo? Pardon? How they have the Downtown Association in Slo? Uh-huh. Some, I have no idea. It's I, I would like some ideas back. Yeah, I saw oh, okay. another bid that has <laughs> restaurants and retail yeah. inclusion. So, and I can actually bring the list of how they contribute. And, yeah. yeah, right. We could bring a list and you know really look at meaningful ways. And when I say meaningful, I mean meaningful for them and the, the entire community and the destination. So They bring a lot of energy and Absolutely. fresh new ideas. Yeah, Absolutely. Good. And then I have um, also possibly looking at moving uh, the bid to uh, the 1994 Act and understanding what the differences are between the 1989 and 1984 T-bid law under the streets and highways codes. Um, is that something that the board would like to look at in the future? Doesn't necessarily mean next month, but somewhere in the future here, before maybe the next go around so we understand the differences. I need to know the reason why. Well, uh, because there's actually more stability in the 94 Act. You can set uh, the sunset to be, say, five years or 10 years. So, for example, San Diego, I think, has a 20-year T-bid. It sunsets in 20 years. Then you don't have to go back every year and reform your T-bid. It allows you to put in a more stable long-term marketing goal and vision. A lot less staff work, too. <laughs> And a lot less staff work because every year you're not going through three months of querying all the hotels and everything. The hotels are behind it for a certain period of, or the lodging industry would be behind it for a certain period of time to be determined through discussion. Sounds good to me. Okay. More information is always better. Would that be a staff report, Jen? Um, I don't know. I'm going to, let me think about that. We'll bring it back some. That might just be a presentation by the city attorney or. Okay. And then I also have that uh, we have some revenue above what our budgeted number was, that uh, it's a budget adjustment. And if we can look at bringing that budget adjustment number back so that it can be included in, and uh, used for things like, uh, we, through these talks, like the theater or whatever, but that budget adjustment number, we need to know what that is because it's looming out there kind of like a cloud. And uh, we need to allocate that budget budgeting number and you want a recommendation from me on how to use the funds yes okay. uh, and then uh, a long-standing one that has been this is my own personal one I want to see if I can get board support for this I was going to bring this up and then all these other ones came up um, the banners city citywide banners Flags. Are, uh, banner flags. flags on banner flagpoles the flagpole looks like this it's out in front of your hotel and it has a banner on it um, I'd like to see us have a cohesive program for banners, and I'd like to see the banners be cohesive throughout the community. And the banners we're using right now have the old Discover logo on them. They don't even have our current logo on them. They're m mismatched. We have broken banner flag holders. Some of them hang down. I, I mean, we need to understand wh what we have, who's putting them up. Sometimes I see car show ones up. There's bird festival. There's different ones on the Embarcadero than there are uptown. What's our plan? How do we use it? And how does that help us uh, create a beautiful presentation for our destination. We talk about beautification, and that's part of it. So I'd like to understand what we're doing and how we can improve upon that. I don't know how you all feel, but in the past, this entity paid for those destination banners, the ones that say Discover. 
who maintains the banners the city or it's a it's a very big discussion there's several different um, rods that are different sizes so nothing is consistent they all have to be changed and it's it's kind of a mess to be honest but it does need to be dealt with at some point so city um, maintenance department puts them up and down and um, I mean we can put into requests to have they have like kind of a schedule that they do so I mean we can pull that um, the city banner banner that's in the city park is managed by the rec department so I mean I don't manage any of those but I mean I can look into it. it's just it's just time but I'll figure it out I know it's an issue yeah I'm I'm curious how many different sizes we have and whatnot because if we decide to develop a plan maybe we do want to change to all the same size or something so all that information is I mean you know, possibly out there. we want to look at this after all the new wayfinding is done because one of the things that is on that schedule is new poles you know it's all those green those pretty teal new poles that they're gonna change okay. out so I mean I, so just so you know internally I've asked Liz to kind of f kind of get through that weeds and get some banners up and downtown because no banners is a problem right now right. just so you know so that is being done that does not resolve the issue um, but I would I would hold on that item until you know Scott Graham is closer on getting all the signage up Okay, at the, at the next, uh, can you give us an update on that signage? At, maybe at the next, uh, so we can understand when we're talking about. I mean, I'm, I'm just hoping that we don't go through another summer season wonky. On the upside, all those banners are beautiful. I know, the when they're up, they're gorgeous. Up great. I don't know if we're paying a fee for someone to design those or not. Um, mm -hmm. They're very old. Uh, they, they have not been designed in several uh, years. To be well, the the Morro Bay T-shirt shop, and I'm forgetting his Brian. He'd probably be interested in designing those things if you're updating, and probably wouldn't even charge. Yeah, there's a lot of so folks much who good local. He's a great artist. And I, when I'm walking on the Embarcadero, I hear great comments about the one with the fireworks and the the kind of Fourth of July one. People are like, "What a pretty banner!" Yeah, <clears throat> it's nice. Any other future agenda items? Okay, seeing none, meeting is adjourned 1108. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Actually.